students, welcome to our remote learning lesson. Hopefully Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is all we're doing our remote learning for this time round. Um, rather than just consolidate, I thought it was pretty important with our timeline to move on a little bit. Um, today I'm in an all-day meeting, so going to be unavailable for you. You'll have somebody else marking the role for today's lesson. So have a look on the lesson plan about how you want them to either email or join a Zoom to mark the role. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, I might not be able to reply to them until later, once my meeting is completed or even tomorrow, but I'm more than happy to answer those questions. Basically, the setup for today's lesson is that I've taken a few screenshots of the textbook that you should have been able to take home with you. Um, I'll guide you through the learning of some parts of chapter two throughout today's video. Feel free to pause my video, um, go ahead and read that section yourself, either before or afterwards, whatever works best for you. Um, that's your book, so make sure that you feel free to highlight or circle anything. Um, but it's also really important to continue to place this into your notes, wherever your notes are being taken, whether that be on computer or in your workbook, making sure that you completed um, this new series of notes and adding on to where we finished our notes uh, last week is really important. I'm not going to keep you for the entire lesson on this video, probably should be for about half the lesson and then after that I think it's really important to give you some time to get onto Ed Rollo, get into your peak book if you haven't been already working your way through this booklet here. All of the learning for chapter one is completed now, which means that all the questions for chapter one should be able to be completed as well. The other thing that I'll mention to you, um, these two labs, apologies that that's in reverse, but that practice strategies one um, that we completed last week along with our feedback. So that is the um, frisbees with your non-dominant hand throwing to your partner backwards and forwards and also um, blindfold frisbee golf. So there's some discussion questions there that you can complete. So once you've done the notes from this video, you've got your labs, you've got your peak book, and you've got your Ed Rollo. Heaps of work that can take you through to the 75 minutes, and I would urge you very strongly not to waste this time. So without further ado, I'm gonna get straight into uh, our scanned version of these documents. So this is chapter two, and we have started talking about this, but not particularly taking specific notes about this at the moment. Um, I want to make sure that we're on top of this so that we can have plenty of practice questions prior to the sack in the last week of term. Now, I like to always spend a bit of time on this first page, making sure that we're mapping the key knowledge and skills, which is taken from the VCAA study design here, and making sure that we've made sense of it for everyone. So. We want to actually look at motor skill development with participation and performance. That I'll cover off today. Influences on movements, individual, task, environmental, and motor skill. That will be covered off today. Qualitative movement analysis principles. I will start beginning to talk about that, but not this cycle, the preparation observation. That will be in another lesson later this week. Directing constraints-based approaches I'll touch on today, but I will leave the socio-cultural factors out today. So three out of five dot points are going to be covered in today's lesson, okay? And then we'll completely um, work around these skills when we get back in person or in a later lesson, um, both in our practical classes and also in our practice questions that we will work through in that booklet together. Apologies for my yawn. It's been a very long day. So having a look at what it means to improve someone's skills is a culmination of all five of these aspects here. So how well people develop their motor skills, their participation and what their performance levels are like helps them either improve skills on a large or small scale. Whether we provide them with qualitative movement analysis principles and whether we do that correctly or not will help improve skills. Also, what are the influences that the movement has in terms of that individual, the task, the environment, etc.? We'll discuss that in today's video. What are the socio-cultural factors that help people or stop people from developing at different stages of their learning, cognitive, associative, or autonomous? That won't be done today, but we will look at two different coaching styles, direct and constraints-based coaching, which I know that I mentioned in class last week. 
You'll notice that I've taken this a little bit out of order and I think it's really important that I do that because of the way that I want to explain this to you. Now this is the very beginning of this chapter. So if you're flipping over the page, you'll notice this is straight after what I've just been through in Key Skills and Knowledge. And this document here, this is talking about that first key knowledge dot point. And essentially, if I was to summarize this for you, as young ones are developing and growing and they are working through their FMS, fundamental motor skills and fundamental movement skills, obviously we've learned about locomotor, manipulative and stability um, skills. And as a young one is developing through those skills, what we find is that people who are unable to competently throw, kick or catch, they are unlikely to participate in physical activities and sports later on. And that makes sense, that the people who are more able to complete those basic movement patterns and the FMS, the fundamental movement skills, they're the ones that are more likely to participate in sport compared to somebody who gets to the age of enrolling in team sports or individual sports and yet still cannot complete those basic movement patterns. What we find is that they start to try and join a sport, they have no success in it, their motivation levels drop, and they leave that sport. Somebody who is having success early on in that grade eight, grade nine, year seven, eight, nine phase, those are the students and individuals that will continue to develop and start to really show signs of developing a, an elite level movement pattern for sport specific skills. So continuing through this, essentially what they're saying is that we need to make sure that as coaches and teachers and um, phys ed enthusiasts, we are coaching and providing feedback the right way so that young ones can develop the proper fundamental movement skills and therefore become more involved in sport. Now I've jumped around a little bit in the chapter here and I've gone further towards the end of the chapter and I wanted to take this time to talk about both direct and constraints based approaches to coaching. What we know is that rather than just doing the quantity of practice, five sessions a week, it is really important to look at what is the quality of the practice that is taking place. Because if we're not auditing the quality of the practice and we're just trying to put 10 sessions in per week, if that coach is developing players the wrong way and they're doing it 10 times per week, that is going to be detrimental to the development of that young one. So if I can't teach somebody their um, locomotor movement skills properly and I don't set up the drills and activities and provide the right feedback for those young ones, then they're going to be learning the wrong way. And so providing the right amount of training sessions or too many training sessions is actually going to be ultra detrimental towards them and have a downward spiral in their skill development. So what's really important is that we start moving away from just trying to get performance in all aspects of training and move towards learning. So if somebody is performing a skill at a training session and they fail at that skill, Use that as a learning opportunity. Use that as somewhere that can develop and grow. And we see that there needs to be a non-linear approach. What that means is that you can't necessarily predict the development phase of an individual. You can't assume that somebody will learn A, then B, then C. If there is an opportunity for an athlete to learn B before they've even learned A, then you need to take that opportunity, enrich their understanding and get them to learn B before they learn A. What I mean by this is if I'm coaching basketball and my plan for that session was to come in and work on everyone's jump shot and yet I see in the warm-up an opportunity to teach a specific passing skill that the players want to learn, that they're trying to develop, that they're learning the wrong way at the moment, then changing on a dime and, and pivoting and, and really focusing on what the athletes want to learn is going to really get them to focus in on that session because it's something that they're really interested in and they're going to develop a lot better in the long run. Now, there's a couple of different types of coaching. The first one is the direct 
coaching approach. Now this is the one where the timing of the task, the structure, the sequence, which tasks are selected, how long we spend on each task, how they're going to be modified, and what technique and strategy I'll use to refine and implement is all determined by the coach. And a lot of the time it is predetermined about how that coach wants to run their training session. Now don't get me wrong, there is a time and place for the use of direct coaching approach. A lot of the time, because we now know that constraints-based coaching does develop a more learning-centered environment and have better retention for athletes later on, we can fall into the habit in examinations of saying that direct coaching is wrong, you shouldn't do it. One thing that direct coaching does was it takes the decision making, it takes the um, unknown out of the coaching session for athletes. So when we're dealing with young ones who can't focus on decision making and simply need to focus on that one skill, if it is right to teach that specific skill in a direct coaching approach, then that is absolutely fine. Take for example, the grip in tennis forehand. If we were to allow the athlete to attempt multiple different types of grip and do the wrong, the wrong shot, the wrong shot over and over and over again, there might be a way in which they can learn that way. However, as a coach, by simply directly explaining to the player and providing different steps of how to perform the grip on that forehand, you might actually get a better and more desired faster result and use your constraints-based coaching for a different skill in the future. I don't think that we should steer away from direct-based coaching all the time, just when we're trying to develop athletes in sports-specific um, areas that are gonna develop decision-making abilities as well. So if we move on to constraints-based coaching, which obviously we're starting to form an opinion is maybe a better way or the right way to do it, we look at this triangular approach, that the constraints are either individual-based, environmental-based, or task-based. And if we put the individual or the learner in the middle of all of these constraints and we manage each of the boundaries of those constraints, we will learn that skill and we will have good retention in that learning. So what we need to think about here is that the cognition and the decision-making process is taken a part of while learning the skill itself Therefore, we are going to push those athletes in a situation where when they play games later on and they start performing at the associative or autonomous level, they will be a higher skill level. Sometimes there is the one step backwards, two steps forwards approach to this one because mistakes will be made. But what we need to start looking at is how does a coach look at each of these constraints and work with them? So... If you have a look here on this page, the next page over, so we're on page 31, I believe, of your textbook, you'll notice that this is broken into a really nice, easy to read table full of dot point form that goes through different examples of the different constraints in the three different categories. Now, as a coach, I need to know my individual. So if I work within my individual's constraints, I can help steer them in the right learning for the skill for them. So if I look at their height, their weight, their limb lengths, and their actual overall body size, if I work with their current fitness levels, if I work within their mental skills and am aware of them, what technical skills they currently possess, what decision-making skills that they have, can they recognize patterns of play, etc. Once I understand who this individual is and I start to create different skill drills and activities as a coach that really cater for that individual, I'm working within the boundaries of the individual constraint. As I move down, I need to be aware of my environmental constraints. Where this player was raised, did they kick in a big backyard or a park? Did they have empty spaces to move around in, etc.? so they had early sport opportunities? 
I need to think about the noise levels. I need to think about, are they getting feedback from other environmental features? Take, for example, football. If they're starting to play in front of a crowd for the first time, their auditory feedback is going to be taken up by a lot of crowd noises. Are they aware of gravity and how gravity really does play an impact on the movement of the ball? And the higher it goes, the faster it will accelerate on the way down. Do I need to take into consideration weather conditions? Where the light is? Is the sun in their eyes while I'm talking to them? Is it a rough surface? So therefore we need specific shoes. Um, what, what sort of structure do they have to be able to continue working on this outside? So if I'm trying to create um, some different boundaries, I guess you would say, that I'm trying to um, teach this individual within their environment while keeping in mind what I know about that individual, I'm keeping within the constraints of now the individual and within the environment. So I can cater for each individual. There are more and they are to do with the social side of things and the cultural environment. I want to talk about those a little bit further on um, in next lesson, not during today's lesson. Mm. Finally, what are the constraints of the actual task? What are the rules? What equipment do I have available? Can I change or manipulate the, court, the, the dimensions of the field or the pitch? What sort of player numbers and sizes on the field do I have? So this is the biggest one that I have manipulating abilities around. I can actually make changes within this task that still cater for the individual within the environment that I have that garner the outcome that I want. So an example here. If I have an individual who is quite lean and fit and can run around for quite a while and I want them to play soccer, I'm starting to think about midfield somewhere where they can continue to run for long times throughout that 90 minute game. I'm living in an environment that has a lot of outdoor areas. So I can pick any outdoor area and I can also know that that individual is gonna be able to continue practicing in outdoor areas nearby. When I create the task, the skill that I want them to continue to work on, I'm gonna start manipulating field size players, numbers on teams, the equipment available. I might use a smaller ball or a larger ball. I might have them running in a larger area compared to somebody who might have to run in a smaller area because of their body size or their mental skill at that current position. Each of these aspects, I could play some crowd noise in the background to try and cater for the individual environment constraint. Each of these things that I'm manipulating is taking into consideration the athlete and what I want them to learn. A lot of the manipulation goes on inside this task constraints and you'll get a lot of questions around how you can manipulate these. But just be in mind that you can manipulate, excuse me, the different terrain. For example, if you have a runner and you don't want that runner to get bored by continually working on the exact same thing, running all the time in the same position, then what you could potentially do is take them to an area that's quite hilly and you can have that athlete run up and down hills as a different type of training and therefore you've manipulated the environmental constraint. So I don't wanna read out this page here, but page 32, I think it's really important that you look at um, why someone might use a direct approach and why someone might use a constraints approach. And so if you, for example, read down this list, no one movement solution will fit all problems. Now, in a direct approach, you can show an athlete how to hit a two-handed backhand. However, you might find that an athlete finds it more comfortable to hit a one-handed backhand. Therefore, you don't need to hit the two-handed backhand. So you'll only find that by setting an athlete into a position where randomly the ball is hit towards their backhand and you see how they naturally lunge to hit that ball. Now, when you look at it, you might be able to get them to look at, okay, try hitting it with two hands. Now try hitting it with one. What was more comfortable and work from there? That would be constraints-based compared to direct approach. You can have a read through the rest of this list and take some notes, but I think it's really important that you understand that there is a time and place for direct-based coaching. Okay, finally, I want to bring you to these two pages here, which are the next two pages after the introduction that I've already been through. 
This is all about feedback. So when we're providing feedback to athletes, we need to think about whether we are providing that feedback as qualitative or quantitative. Two very similar words, but obviously with very different meanings. Now, I want to go through this very briefly for you and spend some more time as you go through questions and as you start thinking about feedback that you've had in the past. Now, this is all about movement analysis, whether it be the movement of your arm or movement of your body, depending on what sport you're playing. I want to spend some time in our next lesson talking about the four principles of preparation, observation, evaluation, and error correction. But as for today, please understand this. Teachers, coaches, instructors, athletics, trainers, medicine practitioners, physical therapists, and physios, etc., and fitness instructors, also really important biomechanists, can provide qualitative movement analysis. What do I mean by qualitative? What I mean is descriptive. If something is full of quality, it has description, it has meaning, it has purpose. When we use the word quantitative, we're simply talking about numbers and data. So it's important that you understand in your mind right now, each of the people that I've just listed are able to provide feedback in the qualitative sense. That means quality, descriptive information about what is right and what is wrong with an athlete's movement. So you can use a qualitative movement diagnosis tool. You can look for detection of errors. You can analyze a specific skill. You can analyze movement patterns. You can diagnose what is going wrong. You are able to observe by simply eyeballing or using an assessment observational tool. You can also use systematic observation, breaking down that was good, that was good, but that was not, or a clinical diagnosis, which involves the best tools in the trade. A lot of these aspects we're going to talk in more detail about, but essentially what we can look at here on the next page is a continuum. A continuum about how we move from qualitative to quantitative information and data to provide athletes. So, we want to provide descriptive tools to an athlete about how they're developing. We can give them a rating of 1 to 10 and describe that was really, really good. And then as we begin to get more and more specific with an athlete, what we would start doing is looking at what their stride length is in between each step, how much ground was covered. You could start by saying you had a long stride length or a short stride length. We're still not providing numbers and quantity. We're providing qualitative data that's helping improve the running pattern for that person. But as we start to move towards the velocity or the speed of that athlete and therefore the acceleration when they push off the ground and what force they're using, we need to start actually looking at numbers. We would put a force plate on the ground. We would start to time the athlete. We would start to look at acceleration and deceleration patterns. And we would look at each 10 meter segment that an athlete runs through, which we will do as a lab and start looking at when they speed up and when they slow down. And if we couple that with observational tools like the human eyeball or video patterns and with video we can use slow motion analysis where we can also pause and use freeze frames we are able to really provide both quantitative numbers and qualitative data with your descriptive tools so you can read through this table here and see where am I getting quantitative numbers and where am I getting qualitative feedback from a teacher coach or anybody in that um, list that I mentioned before. I think that's a fair bit of information for everyone to take in today. What I really would like you to do is, is find some questions in that peak book um, for chapter two, if you've managed to finish all of chapter one at the moment. And I want you to start thinking about exactly what questions will you be asked about direct-based coaching and constraints-based coaching?
In our next lesson, I will have some screenshots for you. I know that I've got one or two of your peak books. Ignore the peak work today and move on with your Ed Rollo and making sure that those labs are completed. And I know that you can send me an email at any point and I'll get back to you with an answer as soon as I possibly can. Good luck.